the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Verse 2, Judas the betrayer knew this place because Jesus had often gone there with his disciples. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. And now with blazing sword, torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. And verse 4 says, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. And who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, Nazarene they replied. I am he. Uh, Jesus said, Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. And verse 7 says once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given to me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? I want to take four words out of that 11th verse in the New Living Translation and recruit them for my subject for today's message in this new series. And I want to call it the cup of suffering. The cup of suffering. I was first introduced to a drink called Miralax some years ago when I had to take my first ever colonoscopy. If you're not aware of Miralax as a beverage, I don't even know, how, it is so nasty, I don't even know how to describe it. I don't have language or adjectives to adequately and sufficiently describe what Miralax tastes like. All I can do when I think of Miralax is just make faces. And what is also so rough about Miralax is, is that you don't just get a little bit of it, you get a whole gallon of it. So not only is it nasty, but it's a lot of it. And in order to have this procedure, which has life and death implications, colonoscopy is very important as far as treatment is concerned, you must drink the entire gallon of Miralax. You can't drink 50% of it, you can't drink 85% of it, you can't drink 99% of it, you must drink every single drop of the Miralax in order to qualify to get the procedure that has life and death implications. So it is an example of something that is good for you that is not good to you. And even if there are others around you who feel sorry for you that you have to drink such a terrible drink and they pull their cups out and say, well, let me knock off some of this with you. You can't do that. It is your drink and you must drink it yourself. Now, for those of you who've had a colonoscopy, you may be able to relate to me, but whether you've had a colonoscopy or not, or not in your life, one thing we can all relate to is that in this life, you will have to drink something in this life that is painful to drink and you do not want to consume it. And sometimes what you are drinking that I'm calling the cup of suffering is a drink that seems like it's just too much to drink, Lord. I can't. I just can't. And it is interesting that in life, when we have this cup before us, that our natural reaction is to avoid it. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk through this passage and raise a few observations that I hope will be helpful along your spiritual journey in your life. And once again, thank you all for tuning in and thank all of you online for being with us as well. Now, here's the first thing I want to point out is in verse one, which gives us the scene and the context of this passage. It says that Jesus is crossing over the Kidron Valley and he's headed to a place that, that is a grove of olive trees, which we know is called the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's headed. But on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where the drinking of his cup of suffering will begin and commence, where he will be betrayed, he'll be arrested, and, and he'll start the process of paying for the sins of the world and accomplishing his mission through a very, very painful process. But on the way, it says he crossed over the Kidron Valley. I, I thought that was significant because the Kidron Valley is not, the Kidron Valley is a dry place. The Kidron Valley is almost always dry, except after a tumultuous rain. It is a dry place. And I thought it was interesting that Jesus went through a dry place on his way to drinking the cup of suffering. Let me ask you a question. Do you know what it's like to go through a dry place in your life? An arid space in your life? Maybe some of you are going through a, a dry place right now. A dry place is a painful place in space. It is a place in our lives where there's a, a wrestling of wheels. Yeah, my will versus God's will. No wonder that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed for hours in that, in that place, in that place of suffering. And he said at the end of his prayer, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It is a place where we have to choose between what pleases us and what pleases him. We have to make a choice between making people happy and, and doing what brings honor to the Father. It is a place of wrestling between what is best for right now and what is a part of God's plan and how all things are working together for the ultimate good. And the dry place in our life is not a place of celebration. It's more of a place of surrender. Do you know what that's like? That's where Jesus is. And it is the prelude. It is the prelude to his drinking a cup of suffering. But not only is it a dry place, it is a sacred place because it's a place that he went to often to pray. And our, our dry places should be a sacred place because in your dry place is a time when you need God more than you have ever needed him at any other time. In this story, there are certain characters that jump out of the story, the first of which is Judas in verses 2 and 3. We're first introduced to Judas as he says in verse 2, uh, the Bible describes him as the betrayer. Judas the betrayer who knew this place where Jesus would be because he had been to this place many times with Jesus. And verse 3 says that Judas was able to, with, based on his relationships with the leading priests and the Pharisees, to put together this, this, this group of soldiers and temple guards to accompany him with torches and, and weapons to go and arrest Jesus and, and apprehend Jesus. And, and I know Judas is a betrayer, and I, I want to I give you a couple of leadership points in this message because in my life, I usually look at scripture through the lens of my life. And... Much of my life is built around leading. And so when I look at this passage through the lens of a leader, something jumps out at me about Judas. And I don't want to point out the obvious thing that he was a betrayer. And, and betrayers nurture relationships with adversarial groups for their own advantage. 
The fact that Judas was so close to the leading priests and the Pharisees who were Jesus' enemies that he could galvanize connection with them and collaboration with them to set up Jesus shows that he was very calculated. And betrayers are very calculated people. They set their ducks in a row when they're going to make their move. And, but I don't want to point that out. That is obvious. It is, it is obvious that he, he used some private information about Jesus to his own advantage. He knew where Jesus would spend time in prayer. He knew about Jesus' private meeting place with God. And he took that information and used it against Jesus for his own advantage. And that's the obvious thing. I don't want to point that out. But by the way, parenthetically, let me ask you a question. Jesus went to this place so much to pray and meet with and commune with the Father that Judas knew where he would be. I want to ask you a question. And you don't have to answer it in the chat. You don't have to say it out loud. But I want to ask you. Do the people around you who spend the most time with you know where your prayer ground is? That's where the Garden of Gethsemane is. Dr. Hiawatha B. Fountain says that's Jesus' prayer ground. Do the people in your life know where you meet with God at? If, if, if there's a place where you regularly have time in God's word and in prayer, are the people around you able to take someone in and say, here's, here's where she meets with God. Here's where he has his quiet time. Here's where he prays. Oh, here's where he prays. Oh, they just have to scratch their head and say, you know what? I, I've never seen him pray. I, I don't ever remember seeing her in the word of God. It's just something to consider. It's not that you have your spiritual time so that people will know where you're doing it, but, but I'm saying if you're consistent enough and if you do it enough, somebody's going to know where you do it. It's almost like Daniel in the Old Testament. His enemies wanted to set him up and they knew where to do it because three, day, three times a day, Daniel would go in the upstairs part of his house and open his windows towards Jerusalem and pray to God. So when his enemies wanted to set him up, they knew where they find him in his prayer place. Where's your space where you meet with God? Anyway, let me go back to Judas because I want to talk about a very important point. And it's not in verses two and three, it's down in verse five. There's a little parenthetical phrase in verse five that I want to point out and highlight because it talks, it, it says metaphorically something that I want to really emphasize. It says when they asked Jesus, when Jesus asked him, who are you looking for? In verse four, they said in verse five, we're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. And when Jesus responded, I am he, the Bible says right there that Judas, the betrayer, was standing with them. Verse 5, he was standing with them. Hmm. Judas, you're standing with them? You, you used to come here with, with me. You used to kneel here with me. You were standing with me in support. And now you're standing with them? Friends, do you know what it's like to have somebody who once stood with you that's now standing with them? Ooh, talk to me. Somebody. Have you ever been betrayed? <laughs> have you ever been betrayed? Maybe it was in a courtroom. Maybe it was in a marriage. Maybe it was in a business deal. Maybe somebody had the knife in your back and aboard me. I don't know. Have you ever been betrayed? That you're standing with them? Here's my lesson. Here's the principle. Always pay attention to where people are standing. Uh, don't take that. Don't take that on the surface because you're going to miss the point. It's not just where he's standing physically. He's standing with the enemy physically. It is where he's standing in his position. It is where he's standing in his in his opinion. See, people, you, you don't just want to pay attention where people physically stand because because betrayers blend in. They blend in. They don't stand out. They blend in. You gotta wait till they say something so I can know where you stand, what position you hold. Yeah, I don't know where you stand, not just where you where you are on your feet, but what you say out of your mouth tells me where you stand. <laughs> yeah, listen to where people stand. Don't just look. Listen, listen. If you see, the betrayers blend in. Judas was a masterful blender. He blended in. He, even at the last supper, when Jesus said, "One of y'all's gonna betray me," all of them went around the table. Lord is it I? Lord is it I? Even Judas said, "Lord is it I?" <laughs> Everybody passed the bread around the table. The last supper, even Judas broke bread, passed it around the table. Even Judas passed the cup around the table. Even Judas sang a hymn at the end of the Lord's supper. All betrayers blend in. They only stand out when they talk. You know how this all came about? See, there was a moment. Let me see how this all unfolded. How this all unfolded. See, there was a moment. There was a lady who came into a house where Jesus and the disciples were. They're in this house, and a lady comes in, breaks her alabaster box, and an expensive perfume starts pouring it on Jesus' feet and worshiping him. She's worshiping Jesus, and and Judas says, this is a waste of money. <laughs> How, the, 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 where did that come from? If you listen, they'll tell you where they stand. See, right then we know, here's somebody on Jesus' team that has a low sense of value of Jesus. That you're going to tell somebody right in front of Jesus that you are wasting money on Jesus to worship him like this. If you listen, they'll tell you where they stand. <laughs> so when Jesus says, leave this woman alone, she's doing the right thing. What she's doing is honorable the poor. He, this is what Judas said. Judas said, we could use that money for the poor. This is a waste of money. But John says, the reason why Judas was upset was because he was the financial leader of the group and he carried the bag and John was stealing money from Jesus' financial resources. So when John saw this money opportunity that he couldn't get a hold of, he got, was Judas, I'm sorry, Judas couldn't get a hold of his money. He got mad and said, why, why are we wasting money? And, G, and Jesus rebuked him and said, she's doing the right thing. The Bible says that moment he went to these people that he had been nurturing a relationship with and said, Jesus, how much, how much will y'all pay me to set him up and let y'all find him so you can get him? So now he's standing with them and his pockets are loaded down with the bribe money that he received to set him up. But it wasn't the move he made. He had already he had already revealed where he stood, the way he talked. Ooh, if you know, you know. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. You better listen to those people on your team. Always listen to the one who is always counter, philosophically, counter, countering where you're trying to go, what you're trying to do. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody on your team always agrees with you. They always believe, you know, you're human. The leaders make mistakes. We should, there should be times when there's debate and disagreement. I'm talking about that person who is philosophically opposed to your direction and your agenda, and they stick around. Trust me, it won't be long before they take something personal to you that they have access to and use it against you for their own advantage. In fact, betrayers are not against people. They're so for themselves that they'll use whoever to get what they want. So if they can get it from you, they'll stay with you. If they can't get it from you, they'll leave you and stand with somebody else. Where is your Judas standing? You better listen. <laughs> yeah, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And the mouth always shows where you stand. Ooh, that was worth today's message right there. Worth today's message. Let's go back to verse 4. Let's go back to verse 4. In verse 4, the Bible says Jesus knew everything that was about to happen. And when these soldiers and military people were coming to get him, the Bible says he stepped forward. And said, who are you looking for? He did not hide. He did not cower. It's time. Y'all looking for me? Here I am. Look for Jesus. Present. He stepped forward, knowing he would be, knowing he would be treated unfairly. Knowing he would be put, they would put a crown of thorns on his head. Knowing they would yank the hairs from, the, from, from his beard off of his face and they would beat him beyond recognition. Knowing everything he would face, he stepped forward. I don't know who I'm preaching to. I can't even be there to see y'all because of my condition. But I can tell you that the enemy tried everything to stop me from preaching this word to you. But I'm telling you this, whoever you are, whatever ominous future is in front of you, whether it's because of your choices and your decisions
is part of the plan. See, the difference between this garden, the garden of Gethsemane, and the garden of Eden, this is the second Adam, Jesus. The first Adam handled it totally different. When the first Adam had to face his fate, he was hiding in the bushes. Adam, where are you? He doesn't want to face it, and he's guilty. The second Adam is innocent and says, who are you looking for? And step forward to face his fate. And I'm saying, a part of drinking the cup of suffering that God has given us is we need to step forward and say, difficulty, consequences, here I am. I accept it. Verse 5, Jesus tells him, I am he. His statement, I am he, him using the word I am was a reference to his deity. And the statement's momentum made the people fall down. Because <laughs> he said, I'm God. But notice, they're still telling, they say, oh, where's Jesus the Nazarene? They, they were being a bit pejorative and condescending, talking about where he was from, because you know, no good thing allegedly came out of Nazareth. So we look for Jesus the Nazarene. He says, I am. I'm from there, and I'm from all, I'm, all, I'm eternal too. And then he says this. He says, in verses 7 and 9, he says, listen, y'all looking for me. It's me. I'm here. Take me and leave the rest of these people alone. Let the others go, verse 8. And he said that to keep his word to the Father, I have lost nobody you gave me. Now, here's the thing. Jesus is saying, this is my cup. This is not about them. Let them go. Here's the third. Here's another thing I want to give you today, and that is own your cup. Own your cup. It's your cup. Remember, verse 11 says, it's the cup the Father is giving me. Own it. It's your cup. He's not trying to get out everybody else to feel sorry for him and say, hey, look what they're doing to me, man. Look, look you see how they mistreat me. He just said, let them go. Y'all, I know. This is, this is my cup. The Father's chosen for me. This is my cup. See, 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 in my house, um, because there's multiple people here, we write our names on stuff. You know, because we share a refrigerator, huh? Anybody understand that? And we share pantries and everything. So we write our names on stuff. And it's, it's, when you write your name on stuff, that's a message to everybody else. It ain't a message to me. It's a message to everybody else. That means, you know what I'm saying? Keep it moving. That's mine. Right? But that's stuff we like that we don't want nobody to mess with. Uh, and, and, and you notice, you ever notice that, 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 uh, that if you see a, a cup or a bottle of water that has not been finished and you're not sure it's yours, you don't want no part of it. You don't want no part of it. You just want you just don't mess with that. What I'm saying is the same way we write our names on stuff we like, we have to write our names on stuff we don't like and say, that's mine too. That's my cup. This is my medical challenge. This is my cup. I've got to deal with this. This is my cup. This is a challenge in my life professionally. This is my cup. This is, the reason why I say this because everybody got a cup. Honey, everybody's got a cup. You ain't getting picked on. You're not alone. See, sometimes you try to make your cup be like it's the only one. You're the only one in this world. Everybody got a cup. Everybody's drinking something they don't want to drink. Everybody's consuming something they don't want to consume. Everybody's fighting a battle they don't want to have to fight. We all got a cup. If you know what I'm talking about, just, just gently touch somebody. If you're in Landover right now, or just and you're in Greenbelt, just gently touch somebody's arm and say, I got a cup too. Yeah, I got a cup too. Yeah, I got one too. I got one. In fact, some of y'all got somebody, somebody online, put that in the chat. I got my own cup. Put that in the chat. But anyway, I got my own cup. So in fact, some of us got a whole cabinet of cups. Yeah. Don't let the mask fool you. I got a cup. <laughs> don't let the don't let the suit fool you. I got a cup. <laughs> yeah. Don't let the lack of the mask fool you. I got a cup. We all got a cup. And the key is don't. Now some people, when you're dealing with a time of suffering, you put it on social media. You 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 post it. You know that's cool. You you letting people know it's still your cup. Somebody else might go to a prayer line and say, hey, can y'all intercede with me? You go to some prayer warriors. Ain't no problem with that. But it's still your cup. They can pray for you, but it's your cup. Some people keep their cups really close to the best. They don't they don't share with hardly anyone. And all I'm saying is, instead of us trying to make our cup like it's the only one, we need to start cheering each other, just start toasting each other. Here's just your cup. We just go like this. And may you, may you have the best, the best of you in your cup. Because we all have a cup. Opponent. Jesus said the same about them. This is about me. This is my cup. Everybody has a cup. And here's the reason. Here's the purpose of the cup. The cup is for your good, your growth, and God's glory. The cup of suffering is always for our good, our growth, and God's glory. Our good, our growth, God's glory. That's it. Because without the cup of suffering, there is no growth, no good, and no glory to God. That's how it works. Now, here we are. We have this moment. Jesus says, let them go. This is on me. It's my time. Set in motion, the redemptive work of God. I was, I've come for such a time as this. I've come to seek and save. That was lost. Let everybody go. And just when things are about to roll into the redemptive plan, here comes Peter. Cutting up. Literally cutting up. Verse 10 says, Peter takes his sword out and cuts off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest slave. He ain't even time to fight. And he just out of nowhere just starts fighting. Just cutting people. And Jesus said, put your sword back in your sheath. Am I not going to drink the cup of suffering that God has given me? There's so much to say about Peter. Let me, let me, see, let me see where to start. Um, first of all, let me compare Peter and Judas. Because some people think, that there's no comparison. I think there is. They're not exactly the same, but they're not, they're not as different as people think. See, people try to say, well, I'd rather have Peter than Judas. Really? Think about this. Peter would fight for Jesus. He would. As long as Jesus was present. Oh, <laughs> uh, y'all don't read the Bible. Okay. See, see, whenever Jesus was around, Peter was talking, bitch, oh, Jesus, they ain't gonna happen to you. When Jesus, Jesus had told him repeatedly, this is what's gonna happen, y'all. This, this is what's gonna happen. I'm gonna be betrayed. I'm gonna be turned over to the high priest. I'm gonna be crucified. I'm gonna rise. Peter would be like, nah, that ain't happening. I ain't letting that happen. Over my dead body. And Jesus said, I rebuke you, Satan. He had to rebuke Peter. Time, the night he was on, on, the night before his death, Peter was saying, "Man, Lord, they, let me tell you, they gonna lock you up. They gonna lock me up. They gonna kill you. They are gonna kill me." Anytime Jesus was around, Peter had all kinds of like, "Oh yeah, you can count on me." Even right here, they come to get Jesus. Peter swinging on people with a knife. Peter will fight for Jesus as long as Jesus is around. But when Jesus is not in the office, Peter's at the same Peter's at the water cooler saying, "Man, I ain't no yes man, man. I don't even mess with Jesus like that, man. Nah, for real, for, for real, for real, for real, for real, man. I don't even believe all that stuff. He, man, I, ain't, I don't even agree with everything Jesus be saying, man. You know me, I'm keeping one hundred. That's no cap, you know? Now you may not know what I just said." And you may have to ask a young, young person what I just said, but I just told you about uptown Peter. Peter will fight as long as your leader is there. When he's not there, somebody said, when you were Jesus, Jesus who? Man, I don't even know what you're talking about, some Jesus, man. You know Jesus. And you say, well, I'd rather have Jesus, Peter, than Judas. Really? What kind of team do you have that won't fight for you when you ain't there? What kind of loyalty is that? All brave when you're around, when you're off on leave. Man, for real, between me and you, man, I ain't even feeling this Jesus stuff. Mm. But I, let, me, let me keep going. Look, 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 look at what Jesus says to Peter. Peter
It's not your fight. Ooh, somebody needs to write this down. Some of you are dealing with something and it's not your fight. You jumping in the middle of it. You're trying to mitigate the consequences. You're trying to make something go smoother for somebody than it is. It is their cup of suffering. And you keep jumping in there, you're going to get hurt trying to drink somebody else's Miralax. Ooh. And parents do it all the time. Now, a parent knows if a child is sick, if you give them this medicine, they got a shot at getting better. The child don't like the medicine, but you still get to make sure they take the medicine. You don't take the medicine for them and think that's going to help them. But check this out. Every time a child is suffering from the consequences of their own choices, parents jump in all the time and try to take the consequences away. But there will be no change without the consequences. There will be no improvement without the consequences. There will be no transformation without the consequences. There will be no greater revelation of who God is without the consequences. There will be no clarity of purpose for life without the consequences. The cup of suffering is necessary and it's their cup. This is not your fault. I want y'all, everyone, everybody put this in the chat. The chat and I want everybody to land over and the and, and greenbelt to say this. Put that cup down. Tell somebody around you, put that cup down. Put that cup down. Put that, that ain't your cup. That is, put that cup down. That is not your cup. Put that cup down. I remember, I remember, I remember. I remember this night. It was, must have been like 1988, 89. I was off of 8th Street in Northeast Washington, D.C. And I was preaching at a church pastored by Bishop Tate. And his son now pastors his church. Uh, Dr. Lewis Tate pastors the same church, but in a different location, different name. But that night I was preaching with Bishop Tate. And after the revival service was over, I uh, was uh, standing near my car a few blocks from the church. And I was outside of my car talking to a young uprising minister who's now pastoring a church in the area. His name is Porter Lawson. And Porter Lawson and I are having a conversation outside of my car. And a fight breaks out about a block away from us, maybe about 50 yards. And these guys are rumbling in the street. And so there I am standing with my suit on and Bible in tow. And I felt prompted to go and intervene and try to bring the peace of God <clears throat> that passes all understanding to God, their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I tried to do a ceasefire. Would you please come let us reason together? Though our sins be a scholar, they shall be white. I didn't know what to say, but I just felt like, man, come on, y'all should be out here fighting. And I remember I went over there and tried to convince these guys to stop fighting. And this is a true story. They both stopped fighting and both turned towards me. Now, I can't tell you what they say because this is live and they wouldn't be able to believe it out. So I'm gonna give you a clean version. Basically, said, let me tell you something, Slim. Better back up off of, back up off of us. You know what they're saying? They said, this, this ain't got nothing to do with you. You know what they were telling me? This ain't your fight. And I'm telling all of the rescuers and the interveners out here who are trying, I'm not saying you never help people and you never try to support people in their pain, but everybody has a cup. <clears throat> everybody has a cup. And you gotta be careful. You got your own cup to drink. Doesn't mean you don't care. But sometimes we might be preventing something that God needs to happen in order to get the glory. Jesus was supposed to get arrested, supposed to get crucified. And Peter is in the way. And the reason why Peter was in the way because Peter was just basically out of sync. Peter didn't have Jesus' rhythm. That's another leadership lesson. When you got a Peter on your team, Peter just doesn't have your rhythm. As popular and talented as Peter was, he just didn't have Jesus' rhythm. Because Jesus told him time after time after time after time, this is how this going to go down. And every time Peter was out of, out of sync. See, 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 to be, to be, Peter was not only out of sync, but he was also outspoken. It's one thing to be outspoken, but to be outspoken and out of sync, that's double trouble. That means you're loud and wrong. So he's talking out loud and he's wrong. He's out of sync and out, because he didn't take time to understand what his leader's trying to do. And part of the problem is, is seen in what he did. Look at this. Now. Watch what he does. When he takes out his sword, first of all, according to Luke chapter 22, Jesus and his 12 disciples only had two swords among all of them. All 13 of them, they got two swords. So now Peter pulls out one of them, slices the man's ear off, and he starts a fight that he cannot finish over. And Peter about to get everybody killed because he's out of sync. As Billy Berkeley would say, he's on FM and Jesus is on AM. His whole bandwidth is off. And the reason why it's off is metaphorically pictured in what he did. He cut off Malchus's ear. And his cutting off Malchus's ear was a picture of what was wrong with him. His ear was cut off. Peter didn't listen. Peter wasn't good at listening. So he was always responding in the wrong way because he didn't listen. You ever got someone, you got someone on your team that's always answering a question that nobody asked? Or they're swinging at something that we're not even targeting. Let me tell y'all who, whose ear he cut off. He cut off a man's ear that wasn't even one of the soldiers. Look at the text. Malchus, y'all, is the high priest's slave. He ain't even a threat. He was probably carrying snacks for the soldiers. And Peter was like, yeah, what you want? He's like, you know, you try to choke. What you, what you, what you want? What you, what you want? Like, dude, this ain't even, what are you doing? You want, what are you doing? Just out of control, out of sync, outspoken, not listening. Peter. Hmm. Is this making sense to y'all? I hope you're getting something out of this. I'm going to wrap this up. Verse 11. Jesus says to Peter, shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Peter, this is the Father's doing. This is God's business. Ooh, that's so good right there. God gave me this cup. See, it's important that you own your cup, but it's also important that you know where it came from. God gave me this cup. I know the devil can work and the devil does this, the devil can still kill him. The devil can't do nothing that God doesn't allow. If God allowed it, he's got a bigger plan for it. God gave me this cup. See, I'm not the only one that went through a whole lot to be a church today. Some of y'all, there are people who went through a whole lot just to serve today. I'm saying if God gave you the cup, he'll give you the grace to drink it and to honor him. So stop trying to be Peter. Stop trying to be a person. Somebody goes to a fitness trainer and says to the fitness trainer, hey, I need your help getting in shape. And the fitness trainer works out a health plan, a fitness plan, and says you need to do these exercises. But the person doesn't like the exercises. Well, if the personal trainer does the exercises for the person, that's not going to help the person. You, you can't drink somebody else's cup and it help the person who's supposed to drink it. Get out of God's way. That's God's business. That's God's business. That's God's business. I'm not God. So you know what, Peter? Put your, put your sword back in your sheath. You know what you're saying to some of us? Put your credit card back in your wallet. Mm -hmm. Put your words back in your mouth. <laughs> Sit yourself down and let God do what he's going to do. It's not your, put your Put that cup down. I'm going to pray now because the tapestry of the plan of God for your life is personal to you. And I want to pray now that 
whatever wisdom God is giving you through this message would not just be heard and lost at the door and lost over refreshments and fellowship, but somehow it's going to really stick with you and work for you in your life. Father, thank you for this time in your word. And I pray that we won't just hear it, but you would help us to apply it to our lives. You've given us what we